Okay, so uh, I'll start with an acknowledgement. Um, we respectfully acknowledge the province of Newfoundland Labrador of which the city of St. John's is the capital city as the ancestral homelands of the Othic. Today, these lands are home to a diverse population of indigenous and other peoples. We'd also like to acknowledge with respect to the diverse histories and cultures of the Mi'kmaq, Innu, Inuit, and Southern Inuit of this province. So um, what's on the screen right now is uh, sort of the agenda for tonight. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit uh, about International Astronomy Day, which was May 7th. Um, and then I put all the uh, eclipse images together. And so we'll run through there and, and we've got quite a few images. So I'll mostly just uh, uh, curate them. But if, uh, if there's a point that I missed that someone wants to, uh, uh, say something about, you know, don't be shy, just go ahead and interrupt. That's okay. We're, we're all friends here. Um, and then we've got a few presentations for the members' nights, night uh, part, and then observations, the sky this month, and wrap up with news and if people have any questions. So, um, as many of you know, May 7th, oh, so I should also say, um, uh, who I am. I'm Mike Moore. I'm the president of the St. John's Center at the RASC. And if we have any visitors, I'm not sure we do, but uh, um, the meetings are open to the public. And uh, there's an email info at St. John's RASC.ca that you can, that visitors can uh, write to to um, ask for the link. Um, and the benefits of membership, which just what everybody here knows about is this is a supportive community. There's uh, access to the member chat group, which is RESC NL Talk. And if you're not if you're not signed up for that, I encourage you to do it. And I think today's meeting or tonight's meeting is going to illustrate why that's a fun thing to do. There's a lot of information, a lot of nice images there, but also a lot of the technical information, which I'm going to skim over, I've tried to put it on the slides, but if you want technical information about specific images, you can use the date on the slides and go and find, try and find that uh, uh, submission to the chat group and the technical information is often there. We've got our publications, Sky News and the journal and the handbook, uh, equipment rentals, um, and and we, we have now had an Observe the Moon session. I think as we go into the summer, observing member observing sessions are going to be possible. Um, so pretty soon I won't have to say hopefully back soon. Um, there's the weekly newsletter and the monthly bulletin, which if you're not getting you and you're a member or if you're signed up for it, you should look into it. And so with no further ado, um, we uh tried a and it was actually i guess our first event like this since last year's international astronomy day so on may 7th um we had a, an event at the johnson geo center we had an afternoon event and an evening event um there was a an information desk set up in the lobby and you can see uh randy and robert there and um Let's see, uh, it, uh, Marcellus, Gary, Craig, and Chris. Uh, Chris looks like he's um, holding his head in his hands, but he's actually bending over, looking at his um, uh, fold down telescope. Um, so we had uh, some telescopes set up in the celestial room, and we had some stuff, including. Uh, solar viewing set up outside, but um, there were very few breaks in the clouds. So that was really just a, um, uh, a bit of a display. But Gary tells us that there were um, 172 paying visitors to the center, um, plus a birthday party. They weren't all coming just for us, but um, we did interact with a lot of them. 
Um, and then in the evening, we went back from eight to 10 for an observe the moon session in the parking lot. And um, there's a picture that Jim Stacy took through his uh, 4-H Maxitov. Um, and there's a setup that I had with a gob and a Wi-Fi iPad hooked to the camera. And it was cloudy for about the first, well, most of it actually, but it did clear near the end. And as it cleared, there were two groups of about half a dozen or so uh, people that showed up and we were able to give them a little bit of a show, um, but it was fun to get out uh, in an evening and even if it wasn't entirely clear uh, to interact. So that was the uh, astronomy day. Um, and if anybody's got any questions or comments, um, you can just unmute yourself and uh, chime in. Okay, so the other big event in the last uh, recently was the lunar eclipse. And um, I've got a lot of pictures. I'm just gonna sort of go through them. If I've been very organized and had an infinite amount of time, I may have tried to organize pictures from different uh, contributors so that they were grouped by the stage in the eclipse rather than um, by the observer, but uh, that's not gonna happen. But uh, one thing I wanna mention is that uh, using RESC NL Talk, Jim Johnson sent out a link for a Google Meet session and there were um, five of us, I guess, on there during the eclipse. And that was a lot of fun watching it um, on Jim's telescope and sort of sharing what we were seeing. It was sort of interesting because the um, weather wasn't the same in all the places. So some of us were seeing clouds that others weren't. And um, so Jim did an animation um, and I'm going to, uh, uh, let's see what happens if I click off this, it might work. Um, so I'm gonna try and show the animation on YouTube. Uh, can you see this? Is that, can you see that screen? Yay, okay. So it doesn't, it looks like nothing's happened. There it is, something just happened. So this is up until totality. And when we go back to the, uh, other slide, I've got the information about, uh, I think it was once every minute, Jim. And there it is, so. One every 10 seconds. Sorry, once every? 10 seconds. 10 seconds? No. Okay. And the, the first couple of dark uh, things you see, those are clouds that were passing by in contrail. Right. It was actually interesting to see the contrails because as they went in front of the moon, they became iridescent. And yeah. uh, that was uh, different as well. Okay, and we got another, so they, there's the uh, technical information. As I said, you can go on to the RESC NL talk and um, find most of this technical information. The other, um, I'm gonna bring up, uh, this one and move it down onto that screen and hope it works. So this is Jim Stacy's uh, GIF. And what you can see what he's done is if you can, uh, let's see if I'll make this um, do that. So the stars are stationary and you're actually seeing, this is in totality, you see the moon move through the star field. So there's 47 images. This one was, I knew there was one that was one minute images. You can see there's a couple of occultations as well. Yes. Okay, I think that's almost there. So lovely, thank you very much for this one, Jim. I think Jim said this was one of his first 
first gifts, so that's pretty impressive. Mm. Lovely job. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to close that one and uh, get back to full screen mode. Okay, so there's Jim's. We just saw that one. Um, so here's another a, a static picture that Jim sent. Uh, again, lovely red in the uh, um, uh, totality phase. And uh, everybody was commenting on this little hockey stick down here, which doesn't seem to have a name. Uh, we call it the St. John's hockey stick. Uh, so this is one that Chris sent. Chris sent, a, uh, I think, a few. Um, we got some more later on. Uh, so this is also in totality. And then the pedals sent lots of um, lovely shots, some with background. So we've got a couple, two pages of that. So before the eclipse, um, pretty close to totality there. And then sort of a sequence here going um, from partial into totality and lovely pictures there. And Randy sent um, uh, this sequence, which is just very close to um, the onset of totality. Do you want to say anything about this one, Randy? No, not particularly, except these are uh experimental shots I was doing, so uh, hard to get the yep. color in them. Yep. Uh, Robert, um, Robert uh, fortuitously took his shot through a red and green filter, an H-alpha and oxygen-3 filter, so he got lots of red, so one just before totality, and a nice one in totality. Um, Gary Diamond did one. Um, cell phone through binoculars because I guess he had some cable issues. Um, this is a sequence that I took before totality and then into totality. Um, and these are some more that, that uh, Chris sent this afternoon um, with times associated with them. So um, before the maximum and then very close to the maximum, which was around 144. And the, I guess there was some question about the the clock anyways. Is that right, Chris, or? Um, yeah, well, I don't know what it what the camera did. I set the cat at the time just before I went out to take pictures to the second actually. And, um, and uh, the times that it's reporting are, you know, an hour and a half or two hours and a half or whatever um different so it's it's probably just a time zone change i think if you interpret properly it becomes a problem. okay so yeah that's those are about right one and 130 and and um the uh the bright one is not deliberately overexposed that's a 15 second exposure because you can't normally do that during a full moon and uh you can see right down into to about 12 magnitude stars in that frame so, yep kind of fun. very nice so so it's nice seeing the two pictures with a different exposure at almost the same time. And James Kenny sent in some that he took in from use. Um, so I guess that uh, the, the clouds that Jim Johnson was telling us about uh, that he was seeing maybe even got to uh, James a little bit earlier than, than we saw them. Um, but he, he did get, uh, close to totality just not quite yeah just as totality came on it's, it's when the, it totally overcast and i lost uh, lost full view of it but the, yeah the only thing i wanted to comment was the penumbral phase of the first uh, of the first picture you just see it starting on the left hand edge there yep yeah when, when all of us were watching that was uh a subject of conversation was it getting darker or not and of course it was. Yeah. So those are the pictures that I found um, 
uh, from from the group. So we, we had a pretty active lunar eclipse. And Randy, you might know better. I think that we might have done as well as anybody in the country. There were a lot of other places yep. that were clouded out earlier than we were, and yep. or the sun was still up at the beginning. Halifax, I think, was rained out. So uh, yeah. I uh, I posted your four montage shot to Twitter and Facebook, and uh, it got picked up and uh, redistributed national distributed hours. And uh, I think we had five or six hundred people saw them on Facebook. So oh, good, super okay, good coverage. Oh, oh uh, Mike, uh, just before the meeting, I I got a chance to throw together a very inelegant sequence um, that goes all the way into um, the Umbra. And I can show that if you want to share, otherwise. Not okay, problem. let's do it. Is now's the time to do it. So I'm going to make you a, um, a co-host. Hang on. Okay. And I will stop sharing, and I you should I be able to share now. Yeah. Okay. We'll do. Looks like it's working. Okay. There you are. So this is in. Inelegant with my exposure changes and everything, every single frame, just the first 58 of them. Just to give a sense. I use PIP like others, but for me, PIP wouldn't send center the moon, it just would center the brightest part. I tried the threshold, but that didn't uh, work. So, can you see that? Yes, very nice. Yeah, you can really see the red coming in. I think our pictures are as good as any I've seen on the web. Yeah, I think so. This is just about over now. Yeah, I was impressed. It was uh, just just sitting there without any optics or any instruments looking at it. It was so dark. Um, I mean, I've seen lunar eclipses before, but this one was really dark. Um, yeah, that was a comment on the web as well, how dark the uh, totality was. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, everybody uh, was well, impressed except Neil deGrasse Tyson. Ah, well, poor Neil. Who? Ah. Neil deGrasse Tyson. But... The Pluto killer. Yep. So, um, so that's the uh, eclipse part, and now we can go into the um, members' night. So, I think Gary's going to tell us about the Night Shift app. Um, Randy, are you going to tell us about Electronic Focuser? Oh, that was a thumbs up. Yes. And Sue's going to say just a little bit about her ongoing adventure. Um, if there's some time, I made up a few slides about the Batnov mask, which will be reviewed for most people, but I still find it uh, really interesting little applied physics. Um, and, and if there's anyone else that has a few words they'd like to say, it is members night and uh, we could entertain as long as there's not uh, too much. So Gary, I'll stop sharing. You, you need to share, Gary. You need to unmute too. Uh, Mike, do you have your, uh, my program already set up? All I can say is next slide. You'd rather do that than? I, I don't. Um, okay. <laughs> Well, I, I remember now that you sent it to me, but I would have to look for it. So okay. if if you can share your screen, try it. If that doesn't work, I can find it pretty quickly. Okay. Just, uh, okay. Uh, hmm. How come it doesn't say share screen here? Share screen. Okay. Let's see. Anybody seen that? I see it. It's good. How's that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I uh, I have about a couple of apps I use all the time, but this one I like. It's called uh, Night Shift, and uh, I find that because the the weather is so bad here, uh, you know, I plan and say, okay, I want to do this observing tonight, and it, months go by and then it's out of date. Well, this app actually tells me right away if it's a clear night tonight as you can see on the first thing here when you turn it on uh can you see my uh yes 
okay? This comes up and it says it's excellent. It tells you uh, how many hours you have to observe, stuff like that. And then just below, it'll tell you what's, what's there that night, what's the highlight, like in this case it was the meteor shower and stuff like that, or the eclipse. And then it tells you also things. Next one says fill in the gaps. If you got the weather, you can go type of thing and you'll get the uh, infrared, which like the other night, it was saying that it was a bad night for uh, the moon, the eclipse of the moon. So you went on on this section here and it was the uh, infrared cloud map and uh, it showed St. John's would be clear for the moon type of thing. So things like that, you can find your gaps in that. So I like it that it's easy like that. Uh, you can find your favorite object. You can go in and search for your favorite object. And it'll show you when it'll be up, what point it'll be up. You can press on a thing, it'll tell you the information about it. It'll also show you how to find it, type of thing. And never miss a celestial event. It tells you what's coming up. Uh, say I go out tonight and I say, oh, geez, what I'm going to look at. I just press on uh, Planner on this app, and it comes up and it shows me everything that's up that night and everything that's up is in green. So I know, okay, I can go to this one and I can get the information and stuff like that. So instead of having that plan and stuff like that, I can just go out and say, oh, it's a clear night, go out, click on this app, shows me what's up. I just put it in my scope and go observing. So it's great for stuff like that. It has uh, weather, like I said, it's really good. It's a, it's a nice compact app. And, uh, you know, it sort of has everything. I don't particularly like the, it doesn't have a, a very good sky map. It has a sky map and it'll show you where your object is, but it's very primitive. It's at the uh, beta stage. So it's not that good, but everything else is really good. And like I said, in this type of weather, you come home and, you, oh, it looks clear and you press it and it tells you to clear and free and it'll tell you how many hours of darkness you have and where it is and when the sun's, uh, sun will come up and stuff like that. Like you may only have three hours of clear sky and we'll tell you that. It's a nice app to have, it's called Night Shift. Uh, it also <laughs> preserves your night vision, type of red. And okay, that's basically that. If you have any questions, you can ask me type of thing. Uh, this is uh, what I did last summer. Over the years, I've been, I sent all my observations to various organizations to add to their data. I believe the Burroughs word these days is called citizen scientists. It seems to go into a file and not hear about it again. But every now and then I get somebody saying, oh, thanks for your work and stuff like this. And this year I just noticed I got a couple of emails. And this year I discovered that my observations were used in various publications, observations of Venus, a uh, new meteor shower discovered by the global meteor network for from using my data. And uh, this here, it's hard to see. This is, uh, everybody takes these beautiful pictures of Jupiter and Mars. And you can download with this little program and it analyzes to see if anything struck uh, uh, the planet Jupiter or the planet Saturn. And all the information is sent off. And uh, this year, being part, I was one of the 108 people on the impact team. And we won the uh, Gemini Prize for amateur professional work for 2001 on impact detection. We had two members actually find two meteors or two rocks that hit Jupiter. So I thought that was pretty good. And I just thought I'd put that in because I know a lot of people take these pictures and just put them in their thing, but this, there has so much information on it that you don't know about. And if you send the data in, some professional finds it and uses it. So it's nice. So you're, you got a hobby and that's all I want to say. Just send it in. It's kind of fun. And it's kind of fun to see that your stuff is being used. That's it for me. I'll on share now. Okay. Any Great. questions on the gap? Any, Any questions, questions for Gary? Yes, yeah, Gary. Uh, so, where you know, do you have a a website that you send? Uh, you go to uh, 
it's, it's for Androids only, by the way. Oh. <laughs> I don't have an iPhone. I never, so, I it's not an iPhone. It's not an iPhone. All right. So, so uh, and uh, the other one I use is a dark light, which is, I always find I need a red light every now and then. Hmm. And it gives you a red light and can, you know, brightness and stuff like that. Because you know how how you're always forgetting where your red light is, but you always got your phone on you. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, yeah. from the photo store, and it's called uh, Night Shift, and there's not one made for iPhone right now. It's it's in the top ten astronomy apps. It's number six according to the guy who puts it up. But yeah, that, that looks really interesting. interesting. Oh, yeah. sorry, I, I, I Gary, uh, you've been sending your uh, information in for years though, and prior to Android even existing. Yes. So uh, there must be some particular places that accept uh, such information. Oh yeah, there's uh, the American uh, uh, Astronomy Planetariums, if you're doing that. The APL Japan is uh, more active. Uh, uh, it, uh, its stuff is, is, when you put your stuff on that one, it's used almost right away by professionals. Uh, Juno, if you're into, uh, if you want to do a pro-am Juno type of thing, uh, the uh, Variable Star organization loves to get star things. Even naked eye uh, things are very important. So it depends on what your habit is. I, I, I'm a planet person, so most of my stuff goes to planet stuff and type of like that. And they'll come back and, uh, I mean, like even before the internet, I'd get, uh, I'd send in my stuff and I'd get the, uh, a letter back from uh, a professional saying, oh, I liked your work. Can you please do more transits of Venus? Because we need the timings of stuff like that. So it's interesting to, you know, to actually, you know, do something. So it's Gary and, and everybody, it's, it's interesting. I um, was wondering whether I should talk about this. I'm not going to talk much about it, but it's called The Glass Universe by Davis Sobel. And it's about the women at Harvard and Edward Pickering, who basically came up with the classification schemes and did a lot of work with variable stars. And what reminded me of, of it is, it's a, an excellent book, Cynthia and I are reading it right now, is it talks about the founding of the um, American Association, the, the, the variable star, the AAVSO, whichever, Variable star, the American Association of Variable Star Observers, and how Pickering and the people at Harvard used the data that they were generating to essentially come up with what became the beginnings of the uh, distance ladder. Mm. So, you know, you talk about citizen science, and this is an excellent book by David Sobel that some people might want to look at. Yeah, I, I do Spectrum, and I've uh spectrum of supernova and meteors and uh actually the comet what was the last comet we did we saw Neowise. Right one. yeah i did Big a couple one, of spectrum yeah. of that and i've gotten letters back saying they thanked me very much and the the information in my spectrum was quite useful and stuff like because i did before and after and showed how the sodium changed and i it was it's, it's kind of interesting to see that you just took a picture you know with a bit of you know, keeping all the science information there. And they took it and ran with it, which is kind of kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. But that's, okay. that's okay. it. But, okay. Thanks know, a lot, Gary. That's the one. Okay. So, Randy, did you uh, want to share now? Uh, I don't need to share, but if you can uh, make my picture bigger, I, I can go from there, right? Um, can I do that, or can everybody just make the, the speaker bigger? Hmm. I don't know if I can control that, but can you pin him? Yeah. How do, how does that how do I do that? Uh, let's see. Yes. Pin video. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. I just I just pinned myself today. Yeah, because you're co-host. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to move my camera down. And and people can make can click on the speaker up in the top right. And yeah. yeah, I can see everything now. Okay. So I'm sure a lot of you professional types uh, are familiar with uh, focusers and stuff. So I just 
chopped off the end of a, a small scope just to show an example. You're all familiar with the, uh, <laughs> yes, I, I sacrifice scope sometimes, right? Uh, most of these have a, a fine focus knob as well. So for this particular setup, you take off the fine focus one, and this comes with a series of uh, attachments. Uh, this is what attaches, sorry, this is what attaches to the, the focuser side. And then you interface uh, the size of, uh, size of your barrel here with the size of the unit. So this is the unit. It's made by uh, ZWO, right? Which way is up here? So you can see you have a, an attachment for a temperature probe or a hand controller, as well as a uh, typical USB interface. And like I said, on the other side, you have your, uh, your shaft that uh, is controlled by this device. This allows you to get much, much finer control over your, your focus. Uh, I also picked up a, a remote control, so you can actually do this live at the device and not sacrifice. Uh, I particularly bought it for uh, solar work because I find uh, when I'm outside, you know, full blazing sun like, like it is every day, that uh, it's very hard to see uh, any screen where you're trying to focus. And uh, this has much finer focus. So uh, that's what I was hoping to do. Um, you can also interface that with, I'm sure you've all seen these things, right? The uh, ASI ear. Anybody use the ASI ear here? So uh, I, I think at least one gym does. Okay. So uh, this is based on a, a Raspberry Pi, provides you with a single power input, and then you can feed uh, a number of other devices and uh, as well as the uh, this unit as well, right? So when it's all hooked up, I got to remember this goes upside down, right? You can have a scope somewhat like this. So you have your, your uh, hoo -hoo 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 focuser here right there you have your usi ear there you've got your filter wheels and all those things and this is all controlled by an app on your phone or you can just plug it in uh, my aim was to have you know sometimes i uh, i set up my solar outside here and so i can still get the uh, the wi-fi in the house and i can just cable inside either through uh, wi-fi or uh, a cable and i can play with it from in here the device is also uh, recognized by various software packages as well. So uh, uh, anybody else use this kind of advice? I know there are other ones, for example, uh, if you don't have uh, this kind of get up, some of them have a rubber wheel. Sorry, I, I, I'm not down far enough. A rubber, a rubber uh, uh, like elastic band that will go around a bigger unit. So you can actually do a, a, a different focus as well. Um, I don't know what you use for focusing, Jim. Uh, you just use this. This interface is the software, and you can uh, let it decide the, the 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 best focus and all those sorts of things. That uh, there are there are some smarts inside it to allow you to do that. And it uh, it comes with all kinds of cabling. There are multiple of of these different sizes, and uh, so this is all set up so you can uh, you can hook on to different uh, devices. Sorry. Nice aluminum. Questions? So, Randy, I didn't quite catch mm -hmm. where the mechanical connection oh, so. was from the device so, to your focuser. Yeah. You, uh, you take the knob off? Yes, you take off the knob and then this, this goes down over there. Uh, this one doesn't have as a cheap little thing, but that would go there and then this would attach to here, right? And then okay. that, that would be interfaced via this thing to the shaft that the knob came off right so if you take off okay. that, that knob so it's a direct it's a direct mechanical yeah, connection that's, that's your interface on that side to that side goes over this one here right that would go in there okay got it then you can uh, you can adapt different sizes whichever way you want to go right? and as i said this also includes this is a a temperature probe as well come plugs into it so you can uh, if your software needs a temperature probe, you can do that as well. So that's the uh, first thing I bought after the uh, the uh, supply shortage. Uh, 
you can interface these sorts. That look familiar, Mike? Yep. Uh, so, uh, and and it should look familiar to Jim. Yeah. And me. I've got okay. I've got several. Yeah, I've got the hockey puck version of it as well, right? So uh, that interfaces to all this as well. So uh, very good. I like the okay. wireless part. Pardon? I, I I said I like your wireless part. I I have an older focuser that has a <laughs> hand controller, and I find that sometimes when I'm I'm moving it is great, but I find that if I drop it, I got to wait that five seconds to st stop to think from very well. So I like your idea of the wireless. Yeah, so uh, different things these days, I must say. Yeah, uh, some stuff very is coming back. So very nifty there, uh, mm. Randy. This is the 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 one, but the latest one. The, this one is noted for having poor Wi-Fi, so they they added a, a big antenna to it, and they sell it now as the US Air Plus, is it? So, uh, but it's you know, if you've ever seen a Raspberry Pi box, you know what's inside of this thing, right? That's yeah. the operating system in there, right? So it does all the all your it allows you to use your telescope without a PC, do plate solving and uh, focusing and all that sort of stuff, right? It's amazing. Yeah. And it comes with a, uh, a mounting point so you can put it on where your eyepiece uh, holders and stuff. Oh, anybody want to buy a, a guillotined uh, scope? Yeah. <laughs> Did you have to cut it off? Can you just unscrew oh, no. some I just unscrewed. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, that was a cheap little one I had hanging around. So <clears throat> it's a prop for the night, right? Very good. Oh, okay, yeah. if, if there's no other questions for Randy. Oh, I, I don't have the app I can show you. Uh, I haven't got it set up properly. Uh, it's, it's got a uh, an app for the uh, Apple, unlike the Androids. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're not going to get into all that right now. No. Okay, thank you very much. Actually, we should clap for Gary and yes. for Randy. Thank you. Unpin me. Here I go. <laughs> okay, are you unpinned now? Yeah. Oop. I never figured out. Oh, I see pin. If you right click, right click the person, one of the options is to pin them. Yeah, I see it there. So um, our next presenter was Sue uh, said that she would tell us a little bit about her ongoing adventure. Would that be a fair description? Oh, you're, you're muted, Sue. How about that? There Can you are. You there we go. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So I've pinned you. Hope it didn't hurt. No, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I don't, it doesn't look any different on my screen. Um, okay, well, having uh, watched and listened to Randy, um, it just makes me realize how low tech or no tech I am. Well, <laughs> and what, okay. what I see as new equipment is probably very basic to all of you. But um, actually, Michael, you also asked me to just mention um, a few things about how I got into astronomy, because I guess I might be a bit of an odd one out in this group, and um, that I have no formal science background. But I guess I've always well, been many interested. Of us, many don't. But. Yeah, I don't know. I get the impression that you're very technical, though, most of you, which I am not. But anyway, um, just to sort of fast forward, um, I've always been very interested. But it was only really, really in retirement that I began to think more seriously about making this a proper hobby. And uh, it just so happened that I started doing math out of interest, missing my research from my job. And a young man called Riley, and I can't remember his surname now, from the physics department at Munn, was my first math tutor. And it, well, we used to have some interesting discussions about philosophy of science, and philosophy of math. And he said to me one day, there's a really interesting talk from a, um, a professor at the physics department uh, who's come to, you know, going to talk about gravitational waves. And um, it was Ivan, Ivan Booth, who I think was a member of this club for a while. So that was my first kind of entrance, I guess, into this kind of thing. And I really enjoyed the talk. And I found out along the way that there was this local Rask branch that had talks like this every month, among other things. 
so that's kind of how it started for me really and then I began to come to the monthly meetings and enjoyed those and eventually bought a pair of in, in image stabilizer uh, binoculars Canon I'll show you those um because although these aren't new these are still my favorite one of my big favorites can you see these that's uh yes. the 1030s image stabilizer Canon and they are really really good um, and I didn't realize how good they were until um, this year when I started to, I thought I might buy some more equipment. Um, I bought some 25, well, I was looking for 2570 binoculars because I realized I needed more magnification. I was doing the Explore the Universe program and I found when I was looking at the deep sky objects that those were just not quite powerful enough. So in the end, I bought um, some Bushnell large ones, 2570s, and they're not image stabilizers, and I don't find them very good. And I don't think it's just handshake either. I think it's more quality. So I'm a little bit disappointed in those, but I'm thinking of um, getting a little attachment to, the, to, to a tripod. So, because I've got the tripod for my, my camera, which I also bought at the same time, but I'm thinking maybe these bigger binoculars are better on a tripod, but I don't know. I, I just don't think the image is so good. Yeah, um, I think I just, get... anything you can do to sort of brace them against something, even if it's even if the tripod legs aren't spread out. Right. You know, even if they're just right. collapsed, if they're resting on something, that can help a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it would be interesting to compare, but somehow it's not just that I don't think. It's that the image itself is kind of a bit, it's not just wavery, but it's, I don't know, there seems to be some light interference coming in that I don't see with these cannons. Anyway, so that's the first thing I decided to buy with the larger, larger um, binoculars. And then I realized I was developing an interest in photography, which again, I've never had before. The only camera I'd ever had used was a cell phone camera. And I like the night sky um, and I like things like rainbows. And I found myself taking stuff on my cell phone and thinking, well, you know, it'd be really nice to get a decent camera. So I did some research and talked to a few people and I bought um, a Pentax K70, which is my first ever proper camera. And I realized it's actually really rather sophisticated for me. Um, I've, I, my son-in-law helped me set it up and I have used it. But I'm still, it's a really steep learning curve for me. Um, and an example would be this, the uh, lunar eclipse. I set myself up and I took a few photographs, but um, I don't, I still don't quite get the exposure combinations. You know, the settings that you all seem to know really well. Um, I can't quite figure those out, but I, you know, I try my best. And anyway, I took a few photographs, but then I thought, you know, what, I'm going to stop this and just watch it, as I said before. So um, I am. Oh, I've got a tripod for that as well. So I'm going to try a few more photographs, say, of the moon when the next time it's full and uh, put the camera on a tripod. So, OK, I did make a lot of decisions early this year <laughs> on new equipment um, to really push forward this hobby. And the other thing I decided to do, which was a big decision, was to buy a telescope. Um, and I thought, well, it's mostly visual observing I'm interested in. I'm not really, I don't see myself doing a lot of, you know, sophisticated astrophotography, but I would like to see a more detailed image of planets and um, the moon as well. I did the Explore the Moon program with my binos, but I wouldn't mind doing another one with the telescope and looking at it more carefully. Mm. Um, and also I'd like to see, you know, the nebulae, and maybe some deep sky objects, but I'm primarily interested in planets, I think, and the moon. So um, I decided that the uh, Celestron uh, eight inch was probably the better, best one to get more light and everything. I, I mean, I did this research a while ago now, um, and I've got that, but I got it much sooner than I thought. I thought I was gonna have to wait about eight months for this telescope, but actually it's already arrived, which is great. It arrived before I went away up north. Um, but now I realize it's, it's actually really big. Now, I, should, I mean, I knew it was a big telescope, but at the time I thought, well, you know, I'm going to try and get a little observatory so that I can actually set it up permanently in my garden because um, I know myself and I know that I won't be lugging it in and out. I just know I won't. So um, that's, that's the latest stage in my adventure, really, is to just um, 
pursue this idea of having an observatory. And I've done quite a bit of research and uh, spoken to Gary a bit about it. And Chris was really helpful. He actually let me have a look at the observatory he's got on his back deck. And he came and visited my back deck. And I think, Chris, would you agree with me that it's, it's an OK site for an observatory? Um, yeah, sure. Um, you don't have any northern sky, but the planets are all in the southern sky. And you've got yeah. a great exposure. Uh, you can yeah. see all the way down to the horizon for a large amount of your southern exposure. Southern sky. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. And uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm sort of pursuing that. Um, and I'm in touch with Astronomy Plus, which is a shop in Quebec. They, I bought my telescope from there and they were really good about that. Um, I think that one of the most most costly things actually is getting it shipped here. That's a bit of a, I mean, that's going to add a lot to the money. But I'm thinking getting a sky shed, which is the slightly cheaper option. Um, but anyway, yeah, I guess that's it. That's the most exciting part is trying to get the telescope and the sky shed. But I can't see me doing that probably till the fall. You know, if even I might be optimistic even with that. So for the moment, my adventure is more to do with getting use of the camera and maybe trying to work on these new binoculars. But yeah, and, and as I said to you before, I had never seen a lunar eclipse, so that was absolutely stunning. I really loved it. I loved being outside, and I was outside for about two and a half hours just watching it. And uh, yeah, it's great. One thing I have a question, though, for you all, being the expert photographers you are, you know, when you show these photographs and they look orange or red, it didn't look like that to the naked eye to me. Was it just that perhaps there were clouds in front of the moon? I mean, is it something to do with the nope. filters that you use that bring I'll the red out? For that. No, yeah. no, well, um, things can look a little redder uh, just because you're looking through more air, but no, and the moon was not you know, very, very high, but no, it was actually orange and brown and red. The photos that, you know, mine anyway, that, I, that were posted earlier this evening, uh, I didn't change the color of one iota uh, right. That, that, that is exactly what they look like. But maybe so I went. Maybe I went in too early then, because yeah. I went. Yeah, in you, you probably went in too early. Yeah. Yeah. Oh it, dear! I it went wasn't about... until Randy. What time did it get red? Oh, I, I don't have my numbers here. Uh, I went in about twenty to two, and then I looked out again, and the clouds had come over. No, twenty well, to two. I, you should have seen the red have, by yeah. then. Well, I, it was, yeah. Wasn't it was like a dull bronze color. Well, yeah, I mean, it was still pretty amazing, but it wasn't like that lovely bright orange that comes mm. through on those photographs. It's not not as sensitive to red as it is to greens, and and um, right. if it's if it's dim, you might be seeing the green part of the coloring more than the red, and you might actually see it more brownish or bronzy than the red. Um, the camera doesn't really care. I think silicon detectors actually are more sensitive to red yeah. than green. It, it yeah. is more orange than red, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I was saying it wasn't as wasn't as prominent in the red. That's my take. No, yeah, I I think maybe I just might have gone in ten minutes too early. I guess I'd been looking at it for a long time, and it was that I reached totality, and I thought, well, I'm not sure I'm, I've got the energy, yeah. and I was getting so cold by that if, time if to you stay. Were out, Pardon? So you, if you so were out you in your well. Sorry, go I ahead. Was like, sorry, I didn't hear you. I say, Sue, you didn't have your sunglasses on. <laughs> no. <laughs> no problem. No, I do. You. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, I might have just missed that, but I mean, I was there till like about quarter to 20 to two, and it was, okay, well, I'd seen reality for a while. I thought, it's not going to, I'm not going to stay up till four o'clock and watch it go back, and then it flooded it anyway. Yeah. So well, you, I think you, you saw all up. of it. Yeah. Okay. You, you I, saw, I thought I did. Yeah. yeah. No, you were so there until like, just a couple of minutes after the midpoint. So, yeah, you yeah. saw. If you'd stayed and froze your 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 tail off, mm -hmm. uh, all you'd have seen is basically that what you already saw in reverse. That's what I figured. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd like to have seen it though. That said, but I mean, I knew I wouldn't be staying up till four o'clock. It was uh, already late enough. Mm -hmm. anyway, so, that's all I have so, to say. So I mean, you know, I it's can... nothing special. It's just that for me, it's it is quite exciting because it's all very new. Wonderful. I, I guess I picked up from some of my readings that you should look through the viewfinder, and of course, I'm doing that, but then. It's difficult to see all the settings because they're so tiny underneath. Yeah. But anyway, I don't know. I, I did find though, however, I was quite proud of myself. I actually was able to change the settings in the dark 
So I've actually now got to the point where I can figure, you know, I can okay. feel where the little wheels are, okay. but I just haven't got the technical know-how to get to know on the fly when I should be underexposing or, you know, increasing exposure or yeah. reducing exposure. Anyway, well, I haven't if, seen my if, photographs if we, yet. Uh, if we ever get a live session out, I mean, we can show you those sorts of oh, things. Oh, that would be so right. helpful. Yeah. yeah. Really. And, and, just, and just keep trying. I mean, it comes with practice. You, you'll get yeah, a feel I guess. for it. Yeah, I know. And I've got I've jumped in the deep end, really, because I've gone straight to um, manual rather than even using, you know, what they call it, the other sets, the auto sets. Auto sets, yeah. Anyway, that's well, all, that's, all that's the best way to learn, though. Yeah. yeah. And for astrophotography, you'll, you'll need manual because auto, unless it's a very sophisticated camera, it'll just go, what? It's black out there. I won't well, it. that's what my son-in-law said. He said, you know, mm -hmm. if you're going to do anything about the night sky, forget the auto. So that's why I've been trying, but it's not easy for me. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, well, great. Well, thank okay. thank you very much, Sue. Thank, thank you. you for thank you sharing that. Uh, <laughs> that that My adventure. Be a, That's a very good word. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us and, and keep trying them. And I'm I'm glad that you're reaching out to people and and asking because that's what we're supposed to do. And uh, yeah, uh, that's how people like me got started too. Is asking the same people. Right. So, uh, I know, yeah. very helpful. Okay. So um, I'm going to do a very short, uh, let's see, am I, I'm going to share now, I think. Uh, so I'm going to switch to, uh, I'm just going to say a few words about, um, the Batnov mask, partly because uh, for the people who do a lot of photography, this is old news, but for me, it's still, I, it's just such a neat application and so clever. Um, and it's, you know, just a, a beautiful little bit of applied physics. Um, and if you don't do photography yet, or if it's something you're thinking about, it's something you might want to keep in mind. So. Uh, a bat knob mask is something that we can use to um, uh, help when we're focusing uh, through a telescope. Um, and it, it looks like this. This is sort of a typical shape. And so there are, uh, this would go over the aperture. So a quarter of the light going through the aperture goes through slits that are tilted at one angle. A quarter goes through slits that are tilted at another angle. And how about half the light goes through this section where, um, again, it's a, another orientation of these slits. And so to a physicist, I look at this and it looks like three um, diffraction gratings that are oriented differently, but they're sort of odd diffraction gratings. When we, nor when we use a, a diffraction grating for light, we usually use um, something where the slits are separated by um, fractions of a millimeter, and these ones are huge. Um, and that's part of the magic that's going on here. So uh, the next thing I should do is say a little bit about what a normal diffraction grating does. And so here's a picture here of, it's not a whole diffraction grating, it's just two slits, but it's the same idea. And so when light, and so this is light on the left and I've drawn it as plain wave fronts. Um, it's hitting a screen with two slits in it. So we're just looking down along the slits and the waves then sort of come out as um, cylindrical wave fronts. And there are places where they interfere constructively. So the peaks are on top of the peaks. There's other places where they cancel out. So peaks are on top of troughs. And the result is that we see a pattern. So this is one that I would have done for a class on the right. And you can see that um, there's a pattern of light darks spaces. We call this an interference pattern. And it's there are two parameters that determine what you see there. The um, longer the wavelength, so the more red the light, the more spread out. Um, these peaks are, and the 
um, farther apart these slits are, the closer together these peaks are. And so in the Batnov mask, where the slits are very far apart, these essentially all merge into just a line. So what the Batnov mask does is it makes a line of light that's perpendicular to the slits. So the light that goes through this part of the mask, um, so this quarter of the uh, aperture will give rise to basically a line of light that's really many um, sort of peaks, but they're all smeared together. In this direction, the light that went through this quarter of the mask gives a line in this direction. The light that goes through this uh, half of the mask gives a line that goes in this direction. And because we don't, in, the, in this picture, I had um, a laser, so it was one wavelength. The light that we're getting from a star is pretty much continuous, um, you know, range of wavelengths. So you really get sort of a rainbow. Um, so it's really just a, uh, a line. And the trick is that if, so if this is your aperture, so I'm doing it for a refractor, and this is your sensor, being focused means that you've put the sensor at the point where all the rays going through the lens are meeting. That's where your image forms. Um, so it doesn't matter what part of the uh, aperture the light went through, it all ends up at the same place. But if you aren't focused, it means all it means is that the sensor is either too close or too far from the lens for refractor. And so the light that lands on this part of the sensor is coming from one part of the aperture, the light that lands on this part is coming from another part. And so the result is that uh, here are two images of Arcturus. Um, this one's out of focus, this one's in focus. By looking at Arcturus, it's a little bit hard to tell. These other stars, you can see they're much smaller when they're in focus. And when it's out of focus, um, the centers of those three diffraction patterns don't coincide and you can actually see it. So um, if you only had uh, two diffraction patterns, you wouldn't really know where the center of anyone is. But because you've got three, you can see that um, they don't all coincide. The center of this one certainly doesn't correspond to the centers of these two. But when you focus it, and this is the orientation of the mask um, with respect to the pattern here. Um, here the mask was tipped a little bit. Um, when I focus it, this um, part of the mask is giving me this part of the pattern. This part of the mask is giving me this part. This part is giving me this part. And they, the centers all coincide. So that's basically how a Batnov mask works. And it's, I just think it's kind of cool. So I thought I'd share that. So Very nice. I don't know if there's anything there to ask a question about, but... Um, or comment on, explain what I said wrong. No, no, that was great. That was marvelous. How does it make you achieve focus? What's that? How does it, how does it help you achieve focus? I think Robert uh, needs to see the last slide again. Yeah, okay, so. So can you see the difference between this pattern and this pattern? Yep. So, and this is focused. All of the patterns go through as the same point because this, all the light from the star is going through the same point. Here, it's out of focus, but it doesn't look very much out of focus. But the Batnov sort of spreads out the light enough that you can see that the centers of these three patterns don't coincide. So, for me, it, um, it's more that it confirms that I'm at focus. So I will, um, I'll adjust the focus a little bit. And in this case, I did a 30 second exposure so that I get enough light to actually see the patterns. And you know, if I see this, I adjust the focus one way or the other. I see if it's getting better or worse. And when it gets to there, I quit fiddling with it. Robert, you see how the, the uh, stretched X and the, and the stretched plus 
are together on the bottom, although tilted, and not together on the top. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The okay. Yeah. This yeah. this yeah. line here, the the sort of faint line, which I was trying to ignore, but Chris mentioned the plus, so he's sort of thrown it out on the table. That is actually coming from that bar down the middle. It's um, and that gets a little more complicated. You can also get diffraction if you have an obstruction and not just a slit. And there's only one bar there. That's why you get a sort of faint perpendicular bar there. Uh, so Mike, are these uh, masks sort of universal in size? I mean, no, you 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 order one that fits your um, your telescope. particular model. Yeah, or you so you could just go. Uh, I, I probably got these ones on Amazon. Um, I'm not sure. I might have got it from uh, a telescope company, but you get one that fits your uh, your telescope. Some people do it with 3D printing now. Um, I think Jim Stacy was saying that he cut it out of the cut one out of the top of a margarine container or something. Yeah, and if you're that looks too like too much work to me, but <laughs> or top of a coffee can. Yeah, and I'd lose a finger. <laughs> I, I, guess I, I, I have to use an exacto blade. I, yeah, I've I've heard, heard, uh, I use this drill a hole here, draw here, there. You see two in your telescope, and when they're one, your telescope's yeah. in focus. Well, that would work too. Uh, you can uh, you can go online and you can print Batonov masks on a laser printer. Just put an overhead. Remember overheads? You probably can't fly overhead film anymore, but whatever. Yeah, if you could get transparent film, you could print. That's a good point. Anyways, um, that's all I had to say about that. Yeah, Mike? Yeah. Yeah, the, ma nice, the ma Jim. excellent, Jim. There you go. So you said enough magic words that uh, you, when you said 3D printer, I said, that's it. Okay, so I have to ten spend 10 seconds and show people something. Okay. Because you've said grading and Gary said spectra earlier and so on and so forth. So um, take it away. Show and tell. I'm in the process of making a spectrograph around a concave grating. It's a very fancy thing. It's it's only one optic. The grating is is all the optics in a spectrograph. That makes it devilishly difficult to work with. So uh, it took two days to print this and another day to just make the drawing into the software. And uh, it fit on my tiny little crummy 3D printers 15 by 15 centimeter bed. And in all its furry, untrimmed glory, Jim, have you gotten rid of strings on your printer? He's not shaking his head or, yeah. He's frozen, Car I think. Yeah. Carbon, carbon uh, filament, uh, carbon filled fiber, so. Um, Princess Auto had a 3D printer on sale uh, a month or so ago. It was uh, reasonably priced. Uh, under five hundred dollars, I think. Right. Well, this was a this a printer is one hundred and seventy seven dollars, and it was a kit. Oh, okay. Well, it, it's done reasonably well. I'll I'll uh, carry this through and see if it works. But a big camera and filter wheel goes on one end, one of these holes. The grating goes on a backing plate through another one of these holes. Uh, the little camera, little red camera, actually goes in the side here, so that uh, you can know where you're pointing. The slit is a mirror; it's tilted. And I'll keep everyone up to date on whether it works or not. Looking okay, forward to that. Thank, yeah. And you said at some point maybe we'll have to have a uh, someone explaining how you manage space in your house when you start filling it up with 3D <laughs> printers and all the junk that we've got. Yeah. Because I'm I'm trying to think of what I would have to sacrifice if I wanted to put. And there's only two of us in a house that yeah. had more than two. I think therein lies the situation. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I decline to comment any further on that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Moving right along. So th thank you, everybody, for the uh, presentations. And um, we have some... Uh, boy, do we have some member observations this month. So that's great. Um, so I'm going to uh, move through these and uh, I, I will ask some people to comment, but, uh, and if I'm, 
showing your picture and not doing it justice, please interrupt. Um, I think we're doing okay for time. Um, but there's some that deserve more comment than others, so I will um, pull them out. So um, we, we heard from Sue already. And so this is uh, sort of a milestone picture. Sue said her first full moon picture with her um, Pentax and it's handheld. Um, and that's pretty good. So Sue, did you want to say another word about this or? No, no, not really, thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, yep. Okay, yeah, no, I think that's it really. I mean, as I said, that's the first time I actually tried to take a picture with this new camera. So it's not bad, but it's not as good as it could have been if I'd been able to save what I edited. But anyway, that's okay. <laughs> it's pretty impressive for for handheld. Um, oh, very okay, nice. good. Oh, thank you, all right. Okay, yeah. so uh, I, I've got a picture here um, so the, these are now in chronological order, um, refractor, and this is Markarian's chain, and it's just amazing. It's um, uh, in Virgo, sort of the back end of Leo, and it's just so many galaxies in there. And so that's really all I wanted to show there. It really deserves uh, more exposures and I, in a picture like this, they're pretty small, but I, it's one of my uh, favorite views of something. Uh, I do want to say one of the things that happened in April was the planets aligning. And so I've got a couple pictures of that. And it's mostly just to show how spread out the planets were. People were sort of showing graphics and showing, you know, the planets close together and they were. Um, there weren't that many clear mornings and it was a very narrow window when you could actually see them, but they were very, they were pretty far apart and hard to get uh, in one camera view. But this was um, in April, so just a little bit after our last um, meeting and Venus is easy to see. Mars is much harder. Um, you probably can't see it at all, but it's right about there and Saturn you can see a little bit easier, it's right there. Um, and Jupiter, this was at a point when by the time Jupiter got up, it was getting too light to see anything else. Um, th this is a picture, Gary, did you wanna say anything about this? This is one of the pictures uh, Gary posted um, around the time of the Lyrids. So some of these are Lyrids and some of them are not, I guess you can tell by where they're coming from, but this is from his meteor camera. Um, Almost looks like a bubble chamber picture. Yeah, and a few clouds. Okay, well, we'll keep moving. We're gonna see another one from Gary in a minute. Um, we had a window where you could see Mercury. So I've got a couple of pictures um, from us and from Chris of Mercury. So this was April 27th which was pretty close to the greatest elongation. Um, someone help me, is it the greatest elongation east or west at this point? Nobody's gonna help me? <laughs> Where's Gary? Morning, it must have been east, wasn't it? Yeah. No, this is, this is evening. Oh, well then west. It's west. Yeah, so west of yeah. the sun. So um, there's Mercury, pretty easy to see. Um, we did these from the um, um, Marine Institute. And here's Chris's picture, the same night. And so there's Mercury. And then I've clipped out this little bit and blow, blown it up a bit. And Chris, you want to say what this is? Yeah, thanks for doing that, Mike, because uh, you can't see it in the, in the wide angle image. That's the Pleiades. Um, this is when we were all preparing to maybe take a sodium tail, a picture of the yeah. Mercury's sodium tail. So this is a couple of days before that, when Mercury was supposed very photogenically near the Pleiades. And uh, yeah, well, near the Pleiades, barely for the clouds, but got them. Yeah, but that's pretty impressive. Very nice. Thanks. Okay. 
Um, so this was International Astronomy Day. Um, so this is one of the pictures that I took when uh, we had a few people looking. So this was through an eight-inch Dobsonian, um, but it was displayed on an iPad and the camera was being controlled by the iPad. So that's my try at electronically assisted astronomy. Um, Bernard is traveling today, but um, we were all very impressed when he, we're yeah. very impressed pretty much every time he posts something. But this is his North American Nebula um, with his Sharp Star 61. So this is his uh, new telescope, which I think he actually got one and then got parts of it replaced or something, but it seems to be working very nicely. Um, yeah, I think he was saying that the objective lens was pinched or something. He's yeah. The stars, tiny triangles, and he got, and they yeah. very graciously replaced the objective. Yeah. And that's a that's a known problem on the web. Uh, I've seen, you know, all the big people who uh, uh, review these things that uh, they were reporting. So uh, bad batch, I guess. Right. Hmm. Yep. Now look, these these stars in this one look beautiful. Yeah. So this was our other, or my other try at planets. So this is when there were four planets up and it was just about impossible to get them in one shot and be able to see anything. But um, so this is May 8th. So this is the morning immediately after um, International Astronomy Day. So there's Venus, Jupiter, Mars is a little hard to see it's there. But then if I shift it over, and change the exposure a little bit. There's Mars, and I could just get Saturn in. So there were indeed four planets up, and it was easier to see with your eyes than to get a picture of, was my experience. Okay, so Chris, I'm gonna ask you to say a little bit about this one. Um, the uh, brightest list, uh, brightest on the uh, supernova list, the active supernova list, so you can see what supernovae are up in the sky by going to our uh, RASC website, the St. John's Center website, under observing, I think it is. And um, so this is the brightest one, 20, 2022 hours, HRS is the name, in Virgo, uh, very near M60, um, uh, not too far from the, from the Mercurian chain, uh, uh, Mike, that you were showing the marvelous picture of. So uh, this is taken from the backyard observatory, 12-inch scope, and uh, what, 20 uh, three-minute red exposures, and 17 turned out to be cloud three, three-minute green filtered exposures, and I copied the green to a blue uh, to make pseudo color, and, um, and uh, just tweaked it a bit to make it pretend that it was natural color, and um, and this is the result. And you can see the supernova is labeled there. And it's uh, bluish, uh, very hot, and very bright. And uh, yeah, so. Uh, when, I, when I look at this, I think if a supernova like that went off, even in the Andromeda galaxy, it would be pretty amazing because the amount of light that's coming from that, and if it came off, went off in our galaxy, when I mean, do you have a comment about that? It's it's just well, an yeah, astounding uh, amount of energy. Uh, thing, things in the Virgo cluster are of the order of 60, 80 million light years away. Um, and so that's a that's a considerably larger distance than the two and a half million light years that Andromeda is away. And light goes, as as we all know, the uh, inverse square of, of the distance. So if something was four times as way, Far away, it would be 16 times fainter. So you know what's 80 divided by two and a half. Uh, so it's it's um, if if a supernova went off in the Andromeda galaxy, it would all be amazing. This is a Type 1a supernova, which is a white dwarf exploding. And white dwarfs explode uh, when they acquire enough mass from a, a, a neighboring star to basically reach 1.4 times the mass of the sun. It's always like it's a standard acne, standard grenade. Remember the Bugs Bunny Roadrunner cartoon? Yeah. Cartoon? So they all tend to explode with the same brightness. And in fact, that's they're used to determine a very, very great distances because they're very bright and they're all the same brightness. And uh, in fact, uh, dark energy was discovered in the late 90s uh, because of uh, Type 1A uh, 
supernovae monitoring in the early universe. So uh, this one's a little closer than that, and close enough to photograph with a vector telescope. So. But we're we're a few hundred years overdue for one of those in the Milky Way. Yeah, right? the uh, galaxies like ours, and this one is a spiral galaxy too. That's NGC forty six forty seven. It doesn't have a nickname. Um, I don't think it does. It's it's too faint for that. Um, yeah, spiral galaxies like this host a supernova every century. We've been four centuries without one in ours. We're way overdue. Okay. So uh, stay tuned. Anyways, I, I was very impressed. And we have another picture of that uh, coming up. But uh, And so here's, um, I guess, close to that. This is just another field. It, it's actually a, a different crop from the same image. Um, okay. Uh, a little bit below this are just two other galaxies, and uh, all I all I wanted to point out with this was was that the image was fairly sensitive, and a lot of little faint smudges in the very background there are not stars, but they're all galaxies, and they're hundreds of millions of light years away. So, yeah, the, the scope did its job that night. Very nice. Thanks. And you did a moon that night as well. Uh, to, to start off, yeah, through red and green filter, and I was supposed to make a color image of the moon with that too, but I never got around to it, so only the black and white through the red, I think, in this case. Okay. And uh, Jim also did the moon that night. And uh, so, Jim, do you want to just say a few words about this? Because there's some things you can see on, uh, on this shot. Okay. Um... Yeah, that particular night, uh, that was when we got the first quarter moon, and I was uh, trying to get the Lunar X, which is a, 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 um, a bright feature that's uh, uh, visible on the Terminator, um, but, and I didn't see it in this particular shot until I went back, and I, I thought I'd undershot the, uh, or should, I should say that the, that I was either uh, too early to get, to get the Lunar X, and as it turned out, I was too late to 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 get the lunar X directly on the Terminator. It, it, it turns out that several of the features, um, you know, I guess the the lunar alphabet, if you will, um, are actually present in this particular picture. And uh, Mike has highlighted them. So there's a, a the, the lunar V is at the top here. And you can see that you can that's very bright actually. But you can see the distance between the V and the and the ter and the Terminator proper. Is about you know whatever at that width, and if you go down, you will see the actual lunar X is actually a similar distance from the Terminator right there, um, and and then uh, I think it was Marcellus who who turned out. Uh, I think it was mentioned the fact that I'd actually caught the, the lunar L as well. Now I could go in with uh, Photoshop and I can sort of lighten that up so you can see it a little bit brighter. But this is the original. Uh, picture, um, but what was also interesting about this picture is the is the processing I used to bring out some of the colors of the chemistry and the in, in in across the surface of the of the moon surface, the yellow and the the blue. Uh, I don't know what the yellow uh, corresponds to, but I think that the blue corresponds to titanium, for example, in the Sea of uh, Tranquility. There, um, I think that's tranquility. Anyway, the point is is that. Sometimes you have to push your sliders to 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 bring out any uh, any color in the moon. You have to push your sliders pretty hard. So the sorts of things that I did that I that I recommend uh, for moon processing is um, uh, get away, get rid of your sharpening. Uh, don't don't try to over sharpen your your object. There's so many people uh, over sharpen their moon photos, and it looks really it it it, it, it it's a, an illusion of sharpness. Uh, the other thing I like to do is I like to smooth out the the maria, uh, and that's with uh, which I do with the uh, the luminance noise reduction uh, sliders, and then to get any colored out, out of the moon, you have to push the saturation pretty hard. So those are three hints that help bring some color into your moon fo photos. Okay, thanks a lot, Jimmy. I I think maybe that night they were kind of saying that to see the the V or the X in particular properly, you had to be more west of us. I think we were, um, it wasn't just that your timing was poor. I think that 
we weren't in a good place to see it when the uh, moon came up, but or when it got dark. But, okay, thanks. So uh, uh, the same. Let's see. Is that the same night? I can't see because I my uh, little bars gotten on top here. Uh, I. Oh, uh, this was the, the following night then. So Robert and I both did shots of the moon. Okay, and this uh, frightening picture from Gary was May 10th. And uh, there are a couple of meteors in here, but it's this is really uh, satellites, right, Gary? I guess Gary is still muted, but... Anyways, Gary posted this one. Um, so this one, uh, I'll, I'll, so Jim posted this picture and this is M87 and there are some other galaxies here. Uh, NGC 4476, 4478. Um, and I think this one was IC uh, 3443, but the interesting, I'm, I think the most interesting thing in here is right here, and that's blown up in this picture. So, Jim, you want to say what that is? Yeah, I, my objective here with M87 was to to uh, is to capture the what's called the, the jet that comes out of the the central black hole in M87. Now, M87 is one of the brightest uh, radio sources in the in the in the in the night sky. But uh, this is a visual object that, and I was wondering if I could capture it with my four inch Maxitoff, um, which is a rather small telescope. But, and, 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 and in order to do that, you had to take advantage of the, the fact that, the, that, the, um, that there's an overwhelming amount of light from M87. It is a huge galaxy. And, and in fact, this tight crop here doesn't even en encompass all of the, uh, uh, all of M87. So the, the, the trick here I was using was to underexpose M87 to the point where I could see that jet. And I think you can just see it. I don't know if you can point out the, 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 the these are foreground stars here. And, and then in the, they're coming out of the central nucleus of the, of the galaxy itself, there's this little, little bit of a, of a, of a, a hint of a jet coming out of there. Is that, that it there? That's it there, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so it's the, it, it's just another hint that the, sometimes the, if, if you see a lot of photographs of M87 online, you can't possibly see M87, uh, the, the jet, because it's, it's a huge galaxy and uh, it's got uh, gazillions of stars and it's very, very bright. Okay. That's, trem that, that's tremendous, Jim. I think, you even got something of the character of the jet because in like the Hubble telescope pictures of the jet, you'll see it's a, a length of jet and it's almost detached from the center of the galaxy. There's a thinner, less luminous part. And you, you can see that here as well. Yes, like there's a, a bit of a detachment there. Yeah, gap. so so I'm actually pretty, very happy with this. It doesn't look like much. To <laughs> yeah, it's compared. hard to do. But uh, yeah, no, I was pleased with this. Okay, um, so we also, a number of us were doing uh, globular clusters because they were available in the sky. So um, uh, this was the Monday night, I guess. Um, I did M3 and M5 uh, and M13 I did over two nights and um, Chris did M10, but I don't have that here. Uh, Jim did M92. And, and I should have used a button off mask on this one. Right, that's partly what uh, brought that up. And uh, then uh, Jim Johnson, I'll, uh, this image, I guess, is a bit of a milestone because it's the first image from his um, observatory, uh, or the first, I guess, image like this from the observatory. So Jim, you want to say a word about this one? Yeah, Jim said in the chat that he's stepping outside for five minutes or step away for five minutes. Oh. Um, timed just perfectly, of course, because he, of course, has been out in his observatory uh, throughout the meeting. He's been looking, so. Okay, well, when he gets back, we'll, we'll 
yeah. grab him or something. Maybe he's gone out to catch the very bright ISS pass in two minutes. Could be. Minus Anyways, yeah. um, here's the Lobster Claw Nebula, the Bubble Nebula, M52 is down in here somewhere. And um, this I think is called the Brain Nebula. Mm. And, and he's done this just in H alpha with a, an 80 millimeter refractor. So, so Jim now, it's hard enough to do this, but now Jim has two telescopes going at any given time. So when he starts sending in images, he's like two people. Um, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, so this one, this one is done with his 80 millimeter. And this one is done with his 127 millimeter refractor. So I'm, I'm not actually sure which one is inside, which one is out on his old pier. Um, but this is the bubble nebula again. Um, eight hours, almost nine hours of exposure there. Again, uh, H-alpha. Jim still out. And yep. he also got the supernova. So there it is there. Same supernova that uh, we just talked about. And Chris just talked about. Yeah, it's and much Gary, field, that one. Is is Gary there? No. He's not listed. Oh, Gary's we've lost Gary. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's too bad. No. I wanted to ask about this one. Um how we got in so close. Um, okay, and here's Jim doing uh, images of the elephant trunk nebula with um, both telescopes at the same time. Ooh, quite impressive. Oh, and, and John, is John Nugent still here? Yep. John, do you want to say a bit about this? This is uh, Excellent. one of your first... Uh, dark uh, deep sky images yeah this is uh, first one really with using nina and my new mount and it, like i said in the chat it was saved in tiff so dss wouldn't uh, bring out the color bring out the debay or debayer sorry so now i got to set up to save and fits so hopefully going forward that would be a bit better but that's very impressive. That's that's a, a good first effort. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, so M M81 and M82, uh, Bode and Cigar. I'm looking for the space station. <laughs> okay. As long as it stays up there. Yeah, it's minus 3.7 pass, right? Okay, is everybody going to have a look out the window for a second? <laughs> Chris, you know that uh, he's launched, what, 150 new Starlinks the past couple of days? Don't remind me. Southwest. <laughs> okay, it's not going to be the right place for me. We need intermission huh? music. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. I don't know oh. if the people here remember Monty Python's Holy Grail. Mm -hmm. Yes, there you go. Throw out your scopes. <laughs> Anyways, so I did M92, so another <laughs> globular cluster. Um, Randy and I both did the moon on May 14th, and uh, Randy was using his fancy microscope camera. Uh, which I guess, it, do you want to say a word about your camera, Randy? Okay, sure. Um, it, but... It's it's a standalone camera in that uh, it has, uh, if you have a screen attached, it has built-in 
a processor with memory and, and a program running so you can actually do all your normal uh, stuff that you would do online uh, or on your pc dithering and gamma and all this sort of stuff but that's an image straight off the camera on uh, unedited um, so uh, it also outputs hdmi 4k 60 frames per second video uh, it has an sd card you can capture video or jpegs um, you can output over uh, Ethernet it has its own built-in Wi-Fi, uh, DNS, all this sorts of stuff, HTCP. So uh, it's a little heavy, I find. Uh, I'm having trouble uh, getting the balance on my little mount from it. But uh, uh, from the Eclipse, I'm finding though it's not good with the color, the orange color. I, maybe I just haven't had enough practice with it. But it's a uh, it's a Sony IMX334 chip, I think, one shot color. Eight megapixels. Nice Jim Johnson is back, by the way. He just yeah. uh, in the chat. Okay, you can, so uh, I'll go back, Jim. And uh, Jim, we were, uh, I invited you to say something about the first image in your new observatory. Um. Yeah, it was the first time I had an actual good run with a full clear night of skies. Um, I had taken some images in the past, um, probably like partial nights and stuff. Um, but this is the first decent image that I, uh, I didn't mind sharing <laughs> um, from, yeah, the new observatory and the scope and, that and the setup that I've got going on here. So, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it's of the... The bubble uh, nebula region, uh, Cassiopeia, um, and I think Mike pointed out. I think someone pointed out in the talk list that there's a there's a supernova remnant in there from last year somewhere. Um, oh, the the nova um, from last Peter year. Peter Stars to the right of the bubble, I believe. Oh, right, right, yeah, I remember that. So yeah, so uh, again, it's just an HA image, uh, 126 five minute exposures for about 12 hours total. Uh, captured over a couple nights, uh, May 9th and May 10th, uh, using the uh, Skywatcher ED80 uh, um, refractor, uh, using a 0.85 reducer, uh, gives a focal length of 510 millimeters, and uh, trusty, tried and true, um, ASI 1600mm cool camera that I use. Okay, so Jim, you, you've got, so do you now have this? Does the 80 always live inside the observatory and your 127 outside or? Yes, well for now, yeah. As you can see, just be over my shoulder there. There's the 80 and I also have the uh, Samyang 135 lens on the same mount. Okay, so how did you decide which one had to live outside? Oh, they, well, they're both permanently outside. The, uh, the 127 is on my pier that's covered with a uh, I can't remember the name of the company that makes the covers now, uh, Gizmo or something like that. Um, but yeah, that's been living like Gizmo. Now. Yes, that's been living outside for two full years, actually. Uh, it hasn't been in the house for over two years. Really? Yeah. Okay, so I was going to mention that to Sue earlier. If uh, she didn't want to go with a observatory, uh, she could always do something similar to what I did, uh, a permanent pier mount, just with a tele-Gizmo cover over your scope uh, year-round. Interesting. Hmm. Okay, thanks, yeah, Jim. I'm sure, I'm sure I'll change this out yes, at some Jim. point uh, over, over time. Or deluxe barbecue cover. Basically, yeah, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I think Sue was saying something. Sue? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was just thanking Jim for the suggestion. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no. Nice. Yeah. And Jim, while you were out, I was notice, noting that uh, I'm now going to be getting two pictures at a time from you. <laughs> uh, possibly. I've, I've got both scopes uncovered again tonight. So I don't know. Okay. The forecast says that tonight's not supposed to be clear, but it's clear as a bell here. And okay. Yeah, it looks pretty Tuesday, good. So fingers crossed. Okay. And, and this was your North American Nebula? Yeah, and that's taken with the uh, the Samyang 135 millimeter lens and uh, the, again, the ASI 1600mm cool camera. 
Very nice. Hoping to hoping to do a long term thing over the summer with that one, and then eventually do an SHO. Um, hopefully, get 30, 40, 50 hours total on it. So, wow. Okay, and I think the last one we've got is uh, the Crescent Nebula from Chris. Yep, also doing the uh, hydrogen alpha narrow band thing, uh, although not pointing my telescope as accurately as perhaps I could. Um, <laughs> Uh, when you're basing uh, your pointing, uh, your fine pointing on a single, like in my case, three minute exposure, uh, you don't necessarily get a whole lot of signal. And the, the bright part of the crescent, I put too close to the center of the field. Yeah, you can't still very it. nice. Thank you. Not, not one that I've seen much of. Okay, so that's, we had lots of observations and uh, so I, I'm going to pass it over to um, Robert now. Robert, are you ready to do the sky this month? Um, yeah, sure. Did, did you want to share it or did you want me to try and bring it up? Yeah, you can bring it up. Okay, you give me a second I here. I won't spend much time on it because it's been a bit of a long meeting and trigger sky bigs. Uh, the sun, this... Uh, I'm not sure. I don't think this image is the most recent one, although it says maybe uh, 18th nonetheless. So yep. uh, I think it's just the resolution on my screen is not very good. It's showing up the uh, sunspots down in the bottom right of the screen. And of course, in the top uh, left, which are much more prominent. So there's lots of activity on the sun. Um, if you could move on. Uh, yeah. And the uh, morning planets, Venus, Mars, Saturn, and Jupiter. And uh, the most notable thing I think about these is uh, apparently there's a uh, <clears throat> bit of a conjunction where you can get both Mars and Jupiter in the one field of view. Um, I think it's, I don't know if it's the 27th or the 29th, somewhere around. 29th, I think Marcel said. Uh, the 29th, it's also in the Sky News this month. There you go. So. Uh, that's an opportunity, although of course Mars will be much more uh, insignificant than uh, Jupiter, but nonetheless, both will be in uh, possible in one field of view. And uh, 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 what comets are uh, out there right now, um, which are all fairly, uh, very dim, I guess, <clears throat> as you can see there, and uh, the asteroids, um, and that's, you know, you can, uh, if you want to try for one of those, uh, then the information is there for the taking on our website. And uh, principal meteor showers, what's the next one? I guess it's going to be uh, July the 30th um, for the Delta Aquid, I can't even say it, Aquids, <laughs> I'll say. And uh, of course, the big one, the Perseids in uh, August. And uh, some telescopic uh, deep dark sky uh, objects uh, for the months of May and June and binocular deep sky as well. And uh, so here's a uh, May observing challenge, which would be M51, um, which is uh, round about and the handle of the dipper, just below it somewhat. Any planetarium program will show you where to find that. So uh, uh, give it a try. It's actually fairly high in the sky right now. So it's, it's, it'll almost give you a crick in your neck. Yeah, well, not almost for me. <laughs> Definitely. Well, at least if you use binoculars or something like that. Yes. <laughs> I think yeah, actually yeah. from St. John's latitude, M51 sails directly overhead within a few minutes of Venus, straight up. So that's a definite crook in the neck. <laughs> well, the International Space Station passes. We just had one tonight, actually, went straight overhead. I was out and had a look. Uh, I'm close enough to my back door to be able to do that and still hear a meeting. So I cheated a bit, but I, I did see it. It was quite bright. And uh, so, yeah, you can go there and find out when the next one is. Uh, observing uh, sessions, hopefully, uh, 
we will be able to get into some actual um, togetherness, I suppose, with regards to uh, uh, observing uh, as the summer progresses. Um, so stay tuned is all we can say about that. And uh, you'll certainly see an email coming out, communications coming out about that. As, uh, yeah, probably on RESC and L talk. Yeah, all oh, for sure. Yeah. That's another reason why people should join the talk list. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, there's not much in the observing calendar. Uh, there's certainly no listing for uh, uh, observing nights, uh, which we had prior to uh, COVID. We did use this uh, to a degree to show those. But since COVID, of course, it's just showing uh, the lunar phases and when the monthly meetings are. So that's pretty yeah. much uh, all for uh, the sky this month. I don't know if anybody has any questions. Okay, well, thank okay, you. Thank you very much. So um, that pretty much wraps it up. Um, the meeting next week or next week, next month, um, I'm going to talk about Ruth Northcott and Dora Russell. Ruth Northcott was um, an astronomy professor at University of Toronto. She was also a president of the RESC. Um, she passed away in 1969. And uh, our center uh, was given one of her telescopes, which I'll, uh, some of, many of us have seen. Um, I'll take some pictures of it and talk a little bit about what her research area was, what she did. Um, and then the president of this center, one of the, I guess the founding, one of the founders of the center and the president about the time that we got um, that telescope was Dora Russell and Randy and, and Gary uh, knew her. Um, and so with some help from them, I'll also talk just a little bit about her. And you know, so a little bit of a historical talk uh, to wind up the season. Okay, so I think that's it from me. Um, so if 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 people have any other things they want to talk about or any any questions for the group, um, we can stay online for a few minutes. I can suspect I, some people are going to try and yeah. get out and start setting up telescopes if it's nice. Can I mention one website? Yes, uh, we we've had three Starlink launches now in three days, and a day or two after, sometimes you can see the Starlink chain as they release all the satellites and they eventually move apart. And uh, we were fortunate to see the very first one out at uh, Salmon Air Line, oh. and it was an amazing sight. In any case, That's there's a scary. Yeah, yeah, there's, scary. There's a website that will tell you. Uh, when possible, one's coming over you. I really think you need to be a bit dark sky. Anyhow, it's findstarlink.com and uh, it'll, it'll figure out where you are and tell you when, uh, like I said, two or three days after a launch, if, if it's coming our direction. And it's certainly worth trying to have a look at. Not that I'm endorsing them. No. <laughs> well. Yes, I'm I, I remember seeing that. And I guess Cynthia was yeah. with us, and I, it was kind of shocking. Yeah, seeing it go over, and I, it took a while for for me to clue in that it was Starlink because we'd never seen one of those mm -hmm. before. It, it was in the news that something was going up, but Starlink was still pretty new. But I guess maybe Randy knew what it was. But oh, uh, so I don't think we did at the at the, the uh, nature park. No, uh, no, we were. I was scared. I was too. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's like, what the hell is this? Yeah. This is uh, a yeah. uh, Chinese uh, launching nuclear warheads or something? Yeah. Or? <laughs> like well, that, that was the first thing I thought of too. But I think somebody <laughs> said that there, somebody knew that something was launching. We didn't know what Starlink was, but somebody yeah. 
said there was supposed to be something launching. So, and then oh. as soon as we got home, you could see it in the news. Oh, but, we were used to seeing ISS, and uh, so we sort of thought that's what it might look like. But it was like a string of pearls that just slowly went across the sky. So, yeah. you know, like a, a meteor in slow motion. <laughs> well, it was big, it was the same speed as the ISS, pretty much. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, pretty pretty oh. close. Low Earth orbit. Yeah. Uh, if anyone's interested, I am. Uh, I just posted a Google uh, Meets uh, link uh, for once it gets a little darker. If anyone cares to join. Uh, by the way, Jim, that was an excellent time we had during the eclipse. I must say, I really enjoyed yeah. that. That was yeah. that was quite fun. And uh, if people don't know, we were. Out, I was sitting here by my door, uh, showing my screen while I was watching Jim's screen and uh, Robert, and we were just chatting away. I don't know if the neighbors were listening. <laughs> Gary actually had people come and visit him, and uh, he was on the session with these neighbors as well. So I, I don't think my feet warmed up for about an uh, hour after I got back in the house. Yeah, it was pretty cool, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh well, uh, at least there was no wind. No, and it's beautiful out here again tonight. So yeah, get outside. Yeah. See you now, and uh, so I'll catch you all a little later. Okay. Good night. Right. Thanks, you guys. Good night. Good night. Hey, Robert. Well, thanks, everyone. Okay. Yeah. Thank thanks, Mike. Hope well, thank you, everyone. Uh, and uh, I, so showed we'll... you, I showed you this today, Chris. Oh, that's uh, your that's your yellow filter. Oh, you bought one too. Yeah, I bought okay. mine from AliExpress. Only okay. cost, uh, cost forty bucks. So you ordered it last year. <laughs> it took about a month, a month and a half to get here. Okay. So, and mine, just... mine came from Edmund Scientific. Uh, I thought I brought the package in with me to show oh, it. But... I saw the price and I said, uh, I, I'm not going to get it in time for the uh, event anyhow. So uh, <laughs> now I just need to uh, make a, a holder for it. I found, Chris, by the way, that, that do you remember film canisters? You know what film canisters are, right? Oh yes, I still have right. a few somewhere in the well, the, uh, the plastic ones. Hey, John. The plastic ones have a little hole in the middle, and I think I can actually glue that in there, and it actually fits almost perfectly in an inch and a quarter eyepiece. Right? I might have to file off a little bit of it. <laughs> the, um, the, the caps, the cap for the uh, <laughs> film canister. Yeah. Yeah. In in ten seconds or less, mm -hmm. this is one of uh, the little red ASI Zwoll mm -hmm. ASI cameras, the yeah. eyepiece cameras. I, Mm -hmm. This one I use as a finder sometimes yep. or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a CCTV lens bought from I don't know if it was mm -hmm. one of one of them, uh, Banggood or one of the Chinese suppliers. On the back end is an adapter. Looks like or a, to, plumbing. <laughs> yeah, uh, an adapter to put this onto mm -hmm. the camera, and on the front end. Of the lens, it just turned out yeah. that the window that screws onto the camera has the same threads, so it just oh. screws onto the. Okay. So inside, I don't know if you can see it. Yep. Is a uh, my little half-inch filter put in a foam disc. I literally cut a a, a, a disc when you okay. buy SSD, you know, thumb discs. Yep. You put in your, it comes in a piece of black foam. Mm -hmm. That's great stuff. Just use a hole cutter and. Yep. Just press fit and stick it in and screw it together, and that's it. And you have you'll have the way to make it black too, right? <laughs> if you well, get yeah, the, it's already the, black. Ultra black stuff. And then as soon as I had this thing assembled, the clouds came in, and Mercury was not to be seen. Yeah. Well, there's always be another time. Mercury is uh, consistently moving, okay. right? Now apparently the moon has a sodium tail as well. Oh well. So during it's probably tougher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's bigger and more spread out in the sky. But if you point directly away from the moon during new moon, so the sun is behind the moon behind you, and you're looking right down the sodium tail away from the sun, mm -hmm. apparently you can see that with these sodium cameras. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that may be something to try during new moon. Yeah, I can only imagine if uh, this lunar eclipse had been earlier in the night, the frenzy that would have gone on. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, from the coverage that we did see, every every photographer around was out at it. Uh, Alex Way and uh, 
all these people. And of course, they pick the weirdest people to show on the TV, right? Now, one of them, I think, is a favorite of Eddie. He just gives this person coverage all the time. They didn't have the best picture, so. Yeah, Jim said the dandy and that should have gone up. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, I think we all had as good of photos as what they showed. Anyways, it was it was very impressive to see. Yeah. And I had never really seen it like that. Yeah, it was a treat. I, I, I've given it up for loss, basically. You know, a couple of snaps through breaks in the cloud, maybe, as usual. But no, it completely cleared. And it was totally calm. Yeah, I was, uh, was, while we were chatting, I was chatting with my brother in Toronto. And uh, it was raining there. And they were hoping it was going to clear. He did manage to get a few clear shots, but uh, it wasn't mostly clouded. So, uh, there you go. Anyways, I guess we should wrap it up. Okay, 9.30. Thanks, yeah. thanks, thanks Let's call it a night. We'll be seeing thanks, you. everyone. Nice shots. We'll, we'll be seeing you. Enjoyed it all. You yeah. said the link's there if anyone wants to join. Okay. 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 Maybe later on.